All right, a student, I think, in the online class asked the question, um, where does the user of the database fit into this equation? We're talking about designing a database and normalizing it and coming up with that. What is the role of the user in developing that? I think that's what they asked anyhow. That's what I'm going to answer. So <laughs> I hope that's what they asked. Um, really, it can be a variety of things. Um, the examples that they go over in the book are more or less based on, they give you what looks like a spreadsheet. So I've had projects like that where I've been given a spreadsheet and been asked to create a relational database from it. Um, in one case there, was, there were a, a series of spreadsheets that had all these schedules and equipment and all that and it needed to be changed to be put in a database so that it could be a, a, accessible from a website. So I took those um, took those spreadsheets, worked through them, figured out where the redundancies were, talked to the person, and came up with a set of tables. So that's kind of like the format the examples in the book go. For, for the most part, they, they, in many cases, they give you what looks like a spreadsheet. In other cases, you may get a, a set of requirements. You know, they'll talk to you and, and will specify, and through conversation with the person, you kind of get a sense of, of what they want. Now those requirements can either be very specific, if you have a user that is pretty savvy and, and knows how to talk to database designers. It's one of the reasons I think if you're an accounting major here, I think you take this course. Part of the reason is, is if you're going to be involved on the business side of things, if you can like know the lingo of uh, database people, you can communicate more effectively with them. And you can get some like, really good requirements from those folks and you really don't have to do a lot of digging and, and figuring it out. That, by the way, is why people in IT programs also take business classes because it helps to know their language as well. Uh, my minor in school was an accounting minor, so you know, I, I had enough business classes where I sort of know, knew my way around and I could converse with people uh, in that role effectively. But you get these requirements by talking to people, interviewing them, looking at their documents, the knowledge that you already have, maybe from past projects. You come up with a design, you get feedback, and at some point you might build a prototype. And what a prototype is, is sort of a working model. And the reason for the prototype is very few people can truly understand what you're trying to do with an application or a website or a database until you have something up and running. All right. So if you can give them a prototype, which is like a working model, and show them sort of how it's going to work, they can give you some much better feedback. In addition, there's what's called a validating model, where you try to enter data into your database. Uh, in other words, if you were to say, given the prescription example of a, of, a, uh, of a few classes back that, you know, a, uh, you know, a patient has one doctor, each doctor has many patients. Can you enter that scenario in your database? That's one of the requirements. Can you put it in so that each person only has one primary physician assigned to them, and yet a physician can have many patients? If you can't put that in your validating model, then something's wrong with your design and you have to go and rework it. All right? So, the act of entering data, that's one of the reasons I ask you to enter data for some of the tables. Uh, the act of doing that helps you shake out some of the problems that you might have. It helps you identify some of the problems that you might be experiencing uh, in, in your database design. So in other words, if you know that it has to be a certain way and you can't put that data in, there's something wrong with the tables that you uh, defined. What I want to do over the next, um, I don't know, we'll play it by ear, class or two, is talk about uh, a real life application I worked on and, and it wasn't using relational databases. This was, this was uh, a while ago. It was, it was using uh, other sorts of data structures. But we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the problem that the organization wanted to solve. All right. And then we'll try to do some design and maybe develop a prototype or part of the application to do it. So it may take a while for us to shake this out. But I'm going to start out by sort of painting the picture of, of uh, the organization that I worked for and the particular problems that they tried to solve. I think it's always important, and this is, uh, this in a way you could consider this sort of a, um, a, a practice or a run through for your project, because I want your project to be focused on 
problem solving. All right. It doesn't have to solve the world's problems. It doesn't even have to solve all the problems of an organization. But it should address some hypothetical problem. It shouldn't just be just a random collection of data that you're putting together just to turn something in. It should be focused on providing assistance in dealing with a problem. So let me start out by defining the organization I worked for, a little bit about them, and the kinds of problems that we were trying to solve. All right, I worked for a car rental company. I actually worked for a couple car rental companies. Um, and as you might imagine, one of the biggest assets of a car rental company is the actual fleet of cars, right? There's a lot of money tied up with that, regardless of if they bought them or if they're leasing them or whatever, all right? So that's an important resource. And both the companies I worked for were very similar. So I'll talk about them as though they're one experience. It's actually so long ago that in my mind, everything is, has melded together into one experience anyhow. So that's how I'll speak of it uh, here in class. But anyhow, car rental company had multiple branches. In other words, they had branches throughout most of the country. Um, at their peak, they probably had 250 to 300 branches. So, you know. Probably a few in each state, you know, maybe more in the more populous states, maybe none in a couple of the states, all right? So they have multiple branches, and each branch was assigned a certain number of cars, depending on a lot of things, how many they rented out, and so on and so forth. Now, as an aside, they would adjust that by transferring cars in and out. You know, for example, if uh, a branch was really doing good, and they were running out of cars, where a branch a couple hours away was having trouble renting all the cars that they had allocated, they may transfer some of the cars from one branch to another where they're doing a higher volume of rentals just to, to get more uh, uh, rentals going on. All right, But at any given point in time, every car was assigned to a branch. All right, It was in a certain branch. Now they could change that, they could transfer it, but at a moment in time, it was at a branch. Now, as you can imagine, especially given the fact that a car could transfer around, in other words, let's say I was moving to Cincinnati and I rented a car and I drove it to Cincinnati and I dropped it off in the Cincinnati branch. All right? They may say, you know what, we're not going to drive it back up to Cleveland. We'll just keep it and we'll transfer it into our office. All right? If you can imagine doing something like that, what becomes very difficult for an organization is to keep track when certain scheduled maintenance needs to be done, right? Um, I mean, I have a hard enough time with my one car remembering when it needs an oil change, right? Could you imagine if you're dealing with maybe, you know, larger branches may have had 100, give or take, cars. That would probably be uh, about uh, an average size branch or maybe a slightly larger one. To keep track of 100 different cars, when they need oil changes, when they need tune-ups, when they need their tires rotated, when they need all the regular preventive maintenance items. To keep track of all that would be a daunting task, especially considering that the car that you have today may have been in another branch three months ago. So it's very hard to keep track of when the maintenance need to be done. And if anything, branch managers were always pushing to get more and more rentals, right? So. They don't necessarily want to take their car out of commission for a while to get have maintenance done on it. Yet, as you know, that that can be a risky strategy, right? Uh, you're, you're, you know, if you're not, not performing the preventive maintenance to the, to the car, you're risking bigger issues further on down the line um, and, and so on, you know, the wear and tear on the car. So there's motivation to do the maintenance, yet it's kind of hard to keep track of, especially as cars move around from office to office. All right. So as a result, you know, we would have cars that would go a long time between oil changes. A long time between oil changes, and that's not good. So one of the problems we wanted to solve was to have a more timely way of maybe notifying the manager, hey, for the next month, these are the cars that are going to be needing oil changes. Now, in the real world, uh, they usually say, you know, it's a certain amount of time or a certain number of miles for, for an oil change. I, I guess it depends who you talk to, what they say the amount is. We're going to simplify it in our case, and we're going to say that the preventive maintenance needs to be done on a schedule based on a certain number of months. 
All right, we're going to forget about miles. That will, that will muddy up the issue a little bit, and I'd rather simplify it. Now, oil changes aren't the only kind of maintenance that, that needs to be done on a, car, on a car. Tire rotation, change the filters, all those things are things that need to be done periodically. And th there should be a schedule based on a certain number of months that they need to be done. So that's the one thing that we wanted a database to hold. We wanted to hold that information in a centralized location about all these cars so that regardless of where the car was last month, wherever it is this month, a person could look at and say, oh, this car hasn't had an oil change for the past year and a half. I better get it into the shop. Or this one just had an oil change before it was transferred to our location, so I don't need to have an oil change done on this car. All right, so that's one thing we want our database to help us keep track of. Ideally, again, the reports that we're going to give would be, we would give maybe each manager a monthly report of these are your cars that need an oil change within the next month. These are the cars which need tire rotations over the next month, and so on. One of the things you're asked for in your project is to, again, describe the problem that you're trying to solve and to talk about the forms and reports that you're going to come up with that are going to help you solve this problem. So in this case, one of the problems that we're trying to solve is to notify the branch managers of preventive maintenance that needs to be done on their cars. And uh, one of the ways we're going to do that is by giving them a report of the things that are due uh, in, in the current month. That was, that's one of the big issues, and that was a huge issue for us. All right, huge issue for us. There are a couple other similar issues that, were, that are related. So I thought I'd bundle them all together, all right, so that we can play with this and, and really make, uh, make uh, you know, a, a, a database that models the situation and, and talk about uh, the kinds of reports and the kinds of forms we, we might want we might want to have for this database. Second problem relates to recalls. You know, there might be a recall on 2010 Toyota Camrys for example, because they have a problem with the brakes or something like that. Where, well, where are all our 2010 Toyota Camrys? We want to be able to go in and run a report and send a report to each branch manager saying, hey, you have these cars that are under recall, you know, here's what you need to do to address them. So that's another problem that we want to address. We want to, because, what you know, uh, we, we need to be able to, again, know where all the cars are and know what kinds of cars there are at, at each branch so that we can notify them in the case of a recall or, or whatever. Now, the last thing is kind of funny, I guess, but as you can imagine, you know, <laughs> a lot of people, if they have a rental car, they don't particularly pay attention to parking laws, right? <laughs> because the thought is, hey, I'm going to park my car here, I get a ticket, I'm going to rip it up, throw it away. You know, two days I'm going to return the car. Let them try to figure out who had the car over this period of time. All right? And that's what a lot of people did. Well, we tried to recover those costs because that came to a substantial amount. All right? So, therefore, we needed to know not just where the car was in terms of what branch it was, but who the renter was over that period of time. So given a car, all right, and given the fact that a parking ticket was um, entered for such and such car on such and such date, all right, who was the renter during that time frame, you know? We'll simplify things and we'll say each rental agreement or each contract only had one, only could have one car on it, all right? So for each co contract, there's, there's a renter associated with it and there's rental information. And then there's information about like when the car went out, when the car came back, maybe notation of damages, for example, uh, maybe, um, you know, other sorts of notes, the, the odometer in, the odometer out, that sort of thing. So we need to keep track of the rentals for the car so we can say who had the car for a period of time in case there's parking tickets. Or, frankly, in case there's other legal issues. You know, if the car was seen leaving a bank robbery, <laughs> all right, the, 
And, and, and you laugh, but believe me, you know, I worked at the corporate headquarters of, uh, of uh, the rental car office. So I got like the good stories filtered down, you know. But the people that actually worked in the branch locations, they had like nightmare stories of like the things people did to our cars and uh, the, the legal trouble people got into and cops wanting to know who had the car at a certain date and time and, and all that sort of thing. So anyhow, that in a nutshell is what we want to build a database for. And let me summarize the main points. Car rental company, multiple branches. Cars are assigned to a given branch at a moment in time. That, however, can change and it can be transferred from one branch to another. Uh, we want to be able to keep track of when maintenance was performed on the car and be able to say if maintenance is due for a car. All right. How do we know if maintenance is due? We know it's due based on a period of time. Now we want to keep track of several different maintenances for the car. We, you know, oil change is the one I kept repeating over and over again, but there's other things as well. You know, there would be, um, you know, uh, rotating the tires, checking the brakes, all these sort of preventive maintenance things that they would want to do. So we're not just talking about one thing. We're talking about several items that we would want to check for. We need to know where the car was in the case of parking tickets. Specifically, we need to know who was renting the car at the time the parking ticket was given. And lastly, we need to know car, where cars are in case the model of that car is, um, has been recalled. All right. So that's, that's a statement of the problem. And we talked a little bit about some of the reports. We might have inquiry forms where you type in where you pick a car and it shows a history of rentals, that might be a tool that would, would help out people identifying that. Or enter in a car and it shows the maintenance history of the car, that would be another possible form that we could have or report. We could have a report that you would enter in a model and make of a car and a year of the car and it would show you by location where all the cars were and, and, and so on. And then we talked about the one where it would show needed maintenance uh, for cars uh, for the upcoming month. Now, we have to design the database structure that will allow us to do that though. So let's think about this. I haven't gone through and I don't have a spreadsheet like they do in the book and I haven't even really given you really well defined requirements like I've done before where one of these has many of these. Many of these can have many of these. I've kind of left it open ended. Let's try to brainstorm collectively and try to identify first some entities, then the relationships between those entities, and finally the attributes that we would want to store for each entity. Does anyone want to take a stab at naming an entity? Branches. Branches. So one of the entities that we have is we have a branch. Uh, um, um, branches. What's another entity we have? Cars. We didn't get those two, I'd have been worried. If we didn't get cars, I really would have been worried. I would have just said, you know, let's just take, let's, let's just rest up and try this again on Thursday. All right. Uh, pardon me? Yeah, you blew it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another entity. Customers. Okay, customers. Another entity. Maintenance procedures. I like that. In other words, what would you see in this table? What would you see in a maintenance procedure table? Okay. Very good. The one thing that I said is that there was that there were several kinds of maintenance that we would want to track, keep track of, 
And each one of them could have their own schedule. Like, you know, maybe an oil change we define we want to do it every six or three months. Maybe tire rotations every six months or whatever. All right. So what this is, is this is a list of the maintenance procedures we are interested in. So let's jump to uh, the attributes of this one. I know we're doing this one a little out of order, but what there would be in here is there'd be a maintenance procedure ID. There's going to be like an ID in every one of these tables, right, as a primary key. And then there's going to be the, 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 the description of the procedure, we'll say. And then what I'll call the frequency in months. So for example, procedure, uh, an ID of one oil change might be every three months. Procedure two, tire rotation. What would be a good frequency for that? Six months? Um, will be another uh, check the brakes. What would be a good for that? Say six months as well. Well, we could define as many of them as we wanted to. All right, which is good. Uh, one thing I'm glad we didn't say is is maybe have a slot in the car for the last oil change, a slot in the car for last tire rotation because that would be essentially a repeating field right and we would then be uh, tied only to be tracking those particular um, uh, maintenance on the car where in reality there might be several maintenances on the car that we're interested in okay another entity Recalls. We could have an entity for recall, sure. The way I stated it, I kind of said like, well, if such and such year uh, Toyota Camry was recalled. But in reality, there could be several recalls going on at a time. And we might want to run a report that says, if you have any of these cars, then you need to uh, address it. Uh, other entities. The actual yeah, the actual rental agreement or contract. I'll say rental the rental agreement or the contract, so the rental of the car. Any others? Parking tickets. Parking tickets, sure. All right. Um. Yeah, <laughs> that probably would be uh, uh, anything that's illegal. Uh, uh, yeah, pol there you go, police inquiries. <laughs> that could include parking tickets, but it could, could include other things as well. We're missing a few things. Um, by the way, in the, in the car rental company, uh, usually parking tickets were the main one that they were going after. Anything like more serious than that was like dealt on <laughs> an immediate one-to-one, -one, you know, where the cops would show up at the branch manager and you know and find out. So yeah, the one that would really need to store and research on. Yes, we are missing employees, but um, nothing I really said indicated that you would need employees. You know what I mean? Yeah. In other words, yeah, you're right, but 
there should be employees here, and employees probably would have, well, we can add them in here, um, but yeah, um, yeah, we're, we're, we were missing them. I don't think they're particularly relevant to the problems we described, but if we're going to be complete, we should, we should include those. Anything else? I think I think there's at least oh, two to four or so entities missing. What about what kind of car it is? Well, that would, but there's only a certain number of cars that a car can be, right? So, in other words, you're asking, wouldn't I just have a free form field to say the the the, the make and model of the car? Uh, the problem with that then is, what if there was a recall on Ford Focuses, but someone spelled Focus wrong? All right, then then they wouldn't catch it. So we would want the model and make of the car We'll leave it at that as now. We might we might talk about adding another one later. There's probably at least one other thing on here. We have part of the solution for maintenance, but we don't have the whole solution for maintenance. Not the what do you mean by the schedule for each car? Right. 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 Exactly. This is a maintenance procedures. This is a list of all the maintenance procedures that we're interested in tracking. This is the maintenance performed table where we actually say, yeah, yes, we have an oil change, but that oil change, so we would have in this table oil change, tire rotation, check brakes. In this table would have car ABC had an oil change done on August 1st, all right? Car DEF had an oil change done on August 2nd, and so on down the line. All right, I'm going to try to redraw this to, I'll tell you what, I'll leave this up, take a look at it, see if you have any questions or any potential uh, um, issues and as we're doing this or as you're doing that I'm going to try to redraw it. Are we going to store, uh, which... Yes, the question is are we going to store what branch the car's at in the car table and the answer is yes. Um, All right. I think this is a little better for creating the relationships. All right, let's take a stab at creating some of the relationships. Someone shout out a relationship. Yeah, one to many branch to car. One branch can have many cars, but as we said, at a given point in time, a car only belongs to one branch. Now, 
not to muddy the issue, all right, but in the application that I worked on, we actually kept track of the transfer history. In other words, we would know that it was in branch one from January through March, branch two from March through September, and branch four from October on. But we're not interested in this example. Yes? Yeah, if we were going to do that, then we would have associated with the car a transfer history table that would also have a relationship between the car and the branch. All right. It wouldn't be in the car table because a car could be in several different branches. So we couldn't have like the previous branch because there could be two previous branches. All right. So we'd have to build a separate table for that. Other relationship here. One of many branch to employee, yeah. Employee only works for one branch. Branch has many employees. Another relationship. Yes, one branch has many rentals. Each rental is associated only with one branch. In other words, you go to the Cleveland branch and pick up your car or whatever. Other relationship. One the many make the model. Right. For Ford, there are a bunch of different models. But each model only belongs to one make, one manufacturer. A focus is not both Ford and GM. Many to many customer to rental. Okay. All right, that's a good question. Let's consider the, the relationship between customer and rental. One customer can have how many rentals? Many, right? You know. No, no car rental company is going to say, sorry, you already rented a car from us. You know, we're not going to take your money again, right? Uh, so one to many is definitely the case. I guess the question is, is a rental, does it belong to one customer or not? Yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, you can have a second driver, all right, uh, in which case maybe a many to many would be appropriate there. Um, we're going to take what's known as, uh, you know, instructor's uh, liberty here <laughs> and just say that there are no second drivers, that there is every rental only belongs to one customer. All right. And therefore, we can say that there's a one to many relationship between customer and rental. Whereas one customer can rent many cars, but a given car can only be rented by one customer. I hope you forgive me for the slightly simplifying assumption. All right, other relationships. One rental consists of how many cars? How many cars are on a rental? That would be two rentals then. Okay. Um, one of the other, I think this one I had mentioned before, one of the other simplifying assumptions I made is that there's only one car per rental. So, a rental has one car, but a car can be rented how many times? Many. So that would be a one to many going this way. All right. Other relationships. What about between car and the maintenance performed? Many to many? Well, 
this, this could be confusing, so I'm going to break this one out. All right, I'm going to break this one out and because this is a case where I think you really have to be absolutely clear what you're speaking of, all right, in each of these tables because otherwise it's confusing, all right. Even the terminology of maintenance procedure and maintenance performed could even be confusing. Maybe we can even think of better words for it. But let's consider what's in these tables and let's really define it. And again, this isn't a trivial thing, right? This is a case of if you were working on this, you would really want to talk to the people to understand the language that they are using. I think I talked about uh, a food, uh, uh, working in the, in the food business, all right? Whereas, depending on who you talk to, one person would call a manufacturer a manufacturer, one would call it a principal. Principal and a manufacturer are the same thing. It's just like, you know, it would be like calling me a teacher versus a professor. You know, that's saying the same thing, it's just a different term for it. Well, it would be important to understand if you're developing a database in that, that food business that a manufacturer and a principal were the same thing. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have two tables where really they're the same thing. So, so sometimes the terminology can be tricky and you really have to work your way through it. Let's consider what we have. We have one table where we said, in fact, we already have it up here. This is the maintenance procedure table. The maintenance procedure table lists all of the different maintenance um, procedures that we're interested in tracking for our automobiles. Okay? So that's the maintenance procedure table. The other table we said was the maintenance perform table. And in that table, we said it would be something like this. That on August 1st, car 123 had an oil change done. Whereas this would be the car ID, this would be the date, and this would be the maintenance ID. Then maybe on August 31st, car 123 had tires rotated. Maybe also on March 1st, car 123 also had an oil change, and so on. So that's how we're defining these two tables. We're saying that there is a maintenance yeah. a maintenance procedure table that has a list of all the procedures that we're going to track and a maintenance performed that specifies an auto had a certain procedure on a certain date. So, what's the cardinality of this relationship? A maintenance procedure can be performed how many times? Multiple times. All right. A given maintenance act performed really relates to only one procedure though. If it's an oil change, it's an oil change, right? If it was an oil change and you had the tires rotated, there'd be two rows in this table. One for the oil change, one for the tire rotation. Now, what about between car and maintenance performed? Remember, it's the same thing. That one of these cars can have many pieces of maintenance performed on it, many, many maintenance procedures performed on it, but a given maintenance procedure performed, the way we're defining it as that it relates to an auto having a certain procedure being done on a certain date, that's related to only one car. 
So what we have is really a many-to-many -many like this. Now here's the interesting thing. This is where, you know, there, there's many paths can, that can take you to the same place when you're doing this database design. Because, let's say, for the sake of argument, we forgot this table. Alright? And instead, we just had a table for the automobile and a table for the maintenance procedure. Whereas the car is the car, <laughs> all right? The maintenance procedure would be, again, the list of procedures we want to track. Then, what would the relationship between it be? Then it would be a many-to-many, -many, right? Because a given car can have many maintenance procedures, and a given maintenance procedure can be performed on many cars. And guess what? Well, we can't have a many-to-many, -many, so we're going to break this down. Car. Maintenance procedure. And we essentially get this again. So it's interesting, even if you missed a step, just following through the process and taking and, and altering that many-to-many -many into two one-to-manys, you get that additional table that you need. All right, couple of tables still out there. For make or for model? Both. All right. Are do. Really, I guess, ah, very good. We could just do it for model. Now you said that there, there's uh, originally um, the student said, well, there would be a one-to-many relationship between make and car and model in car. We really decided. He then quickly came to the conclusion that we really only need the relationship between model and car. Why? Because if I know the car's model, I know the make, right? It is true that for each car, there's one make and one model. But the make is what's called a derivable relationship, right? In other words, a focus is a Ford. It's always a Ford. It's a Ford focus. So if I know a car is a focus, I know by definition it's a Ford, all right? A Camry or a Corolla are Toyotas. If I know it's a Camry, I know it's a Toyota. All right? So there's no need to implement two relationships. Now you might ask, is there a problem in implementing two relationships like that? And the answer is yes. The problem is, is that sort of a form of redundancy. If I store both the model and the make associated with the car, I could store the model as being a Focus, and the make is being a Toyota. And then we have a Toyota Focus, or a Ford Camry, or something like that. How do you eliminate that from happening? You don't implement both relationships. You, if you know the model, you know the make. All right? Now, the last two could be a little confusing. I'm going to state that the recall has a relationship to... has a one-to-many relationship to model. In other words, a recall is for typically one model of car. A, mod, a, a, a car, a model, however, can have many recalls. So they could recall a car for its brakes, they, or, or they could recall a model for the brakes, they could recall for the steering. Legal inquiry, I would suggest, would have a one-to-many relationship this way because a legal inquiry is going to be about one car. Where was car with the serial number or the license plates or something like that on this date? And, uh, but a car could be on many legal inquiries. A person could be parking illegally all day and get 10 parking tickets. All right. 
Yeah, if, if, if it was the case that there was, that they, you kept track of the employee, which is probably a good thing, then yeah, you, you would have the employee that handled the rental. It would look something like that. All right. Since the car seems to be the main table in this uh, thing, and again, a lot of times students talk about like the main table. There really isn't such a thing as a main table in a database, all right? There is it, sort of a network and they're all related. But it's quite clear that the car touches a lot of different things. So we're going to talk, I, I hesitate to use, I started to use the term main table, but I realize that's not a good idea. But it's an important table to be sure. Let's talk about candidate keys for the automobile. What would be some candidate keys for the automobile? Well, license plate. Well, license plate and state combination, right? So, for the car, candidate keys would be the state of registration and the plate. Does that... Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Let's, let's make sure that that's a good candidate key, that it's eligible. All right. What makes a, a, a key eligible? Well, every member of the table has to have one, and it has to be unique. So will every car have a license plate, state of registration, and plate number? Yeah, better, right? So that part of it is satisfied. Will it be unique? Will the combination of state and plate number be unique? Yeah, it better be. It better not be someone driving around with my plates. All right, better be the only one. So yeah, that is a, a viable candidate key. You had mentioned one? Mm -hmm. The VIN number, the vehicle I identification number, uh, or an, another word that's used sometimes is a serial number. Does every car have one? Yes, yes absolutely. It's the law, I think. All right. Is it unique? Yes. Again, it, it better be. All right. Are there any other candidate keys that you could think of or that we could make up? You could just use an auto number, pardon the pun. All right. We could use a car number, which would just be a sequential number. All right. Those are probably it. Those are probably our three choices for primary key. I really can't think of, of anything else. Now, which one of those, which are the best, which is the best choice? Car ID or car number? Why, why did you say that? That's my answer too, by the way. So. Yeah, exactly. VIN numbers are very long. So that means that you'd have to store that, and everywhere that you pointed to a car, you'd have to store those 26 characters. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 probably the bigger issue with the, with the license plate number is, remember, ideally you don't want your primary key as a field that changes often. And the plate could change periodically. All right. Um, the other thing, uh, again, a state and plate is I generally prefer single part keys to multiple part keys. That sort of simplifies thing and, and that would have to be a, a multiple part key. The other thing is that would include, um, that would also include alphabetical characters. How big is a license plate? Well, let's say you have two characters for the state, right? So that's two. Plus, what, how long are plate numbers? Eight characters? 
six, seven. All right, so you're talking about like 10 characters or so. All right, if you're simply using a sequential number, all right, with two bytes or two characters, you could have how many cars? Well, a lot of them. Let's do the math. In just two characters of data, I could store 65,000 unique car numbers if I stored numbers in a compressed manner, if I stored them as binary digits. So in just two characters, I could store 65,000 of them. If I throw, threw in a third character, I could store a number that I have to look at to pronounce or to figure out, 16 million. With four characters, I could store approximately four billion numbers, all right? Uh, again, because computers can store numbers more efficiently than they can store characters. So with four characters worth of information, I can store over four billion numbers. That's pretty much having a car for like every other person on earth. All right, and so uh, you know, hey, uh, probably not going to have that many. We had, I think, at our peak. I'm trying to think. At our peak, uh, this company probably had, that I worked for had around twenty thousand cars. So we could have stored if we assigned a unique auto number or car number. That way, we could have, in two characters, stored all, you know, two characters with all we need to, to assign a unique ID for that. So, for all those reasons, the fact that that auto number isn't going to change, it's all numeric, so it's more efficiently uh, uh, stored, all right, that's probably the best choice. So, I would agree that this would be my choice as the primary key. What do we do with these other things then? We make them unique indexes. All right, and that's something I think we've mentioned, but I don't know if we've actually done. I may have done a quick example of it. But again, essentially a unique index would make that unique, force it to be unique, whereas it's not going to be the primary key. All right? One thing to remember, when you make a primary key, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, I'm saying to make them numbers because they're more efficient to store. Remember, when you store a primary key, you're also going to be storing that value of that primary key everything that, every place that's related to it. So, whatever we define as a primary key for automobile, we are going to store in the automobile table, in the maintenance table, in the rental table, in the legal inquiry table. So we're spread that around a lot. So if we store all 26 digits of the VIN number as a primary key, that's 26 uh, uh, characters for every car and 26 for every maintenance record and 26 for every rental as opposed to storing in a couple of bytes uh, an auto number. We'll continue this example next time. I'm going to try to be smart and take this diagram up to my office, so we'll have it next time. Uh, but we'll use that as a basis sort of to begin and uh, uh, continue on with this, identifying attributes. Remember, we've identified the entities. I think we've done a good job identifying the relationships. Now we want to go in and look at what attributes we need to store in each of those tables. All right.